Continuing the analysis of the tree hugging or post standing posture, now let's look at the muscle, fascia, and tensional forces involved in this posture. When looking at any posture or movement, it's important to note that muscle and fascia form a tensional network where the activity or change in state of one muscle will affect the tension of interconnecting muscles. Though it can be argued that fascia forms a widespread connection from and to any point on the body, I think it is reasonable to suggest that some connections are stronger and more direct than others, and these direct connections have a more influential role than indirect connections. For instance, one can find a semi-continuous path of fascia from the neck to the legs. However, it is more reasonable to examine the direct fascial connections to the neck and its shared skeletal connections first before proceeding to examine the legs. An example would be if you were to investigate neck movements or pain around the neck, you look at the fascia and muscle connections in direct pro proximity or ones that share attachment points. This would be things like the upper trapezius, the levator scapulae, and other muscles such as the scalenes, hyoid muscle, and sternocleidomastoid muscles. In an effort to better understand and demonstrate the tensional forces in this posture, I've created a markup showing the front, rear, and side of the posture, which shows the direction of pull of various muscles involved in maintaining the posture. So starting at the top of the body and working down, let's identify the muscles involved with the posture, including the stretch or shortened state of each muscle and associated fascia also including the antagonist or stretch attachments. The common cue for the position of the head is to pull it up as if suspended by a string. Pushing the head up, especially emphasizing the top or crown of the head, involves a slight shortening or activation of the neck flexor muscles and a antagonist stretch of the neck extensors. The neck flexors are the anterior scalenes and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The posterior scalenes and the trapezius will experience a reciprocal stretch as they are neck extensors. The next postural parameter is pulling the scapula or shoulders forward and laterally rounding the back. The primary muscles involved in scapular protraction, which is pulling the scapula forward, are the serratus anterior and the pectoralis minor. The serratus anterior connects from the anterior side of the scapula to the ribs and pulls it around the rib cage. The pectoralis minor connects to the coracoid process of the scapula and pulls it downward. When the scapula is protracted and depressed, the rhomboids and levator scapulae are now stretched as they retract and elevate the scapula respectively. In addition, this position pulls on the mid and low trapezius muscle fibers due to the scapula position and also the lats due to the position of the humerus as the attachment to the humerus is pushed away from the spine, meaning that the distance between the origin and insertion points of the lats are increased. In this posture, the arms are held out in front with the elbows and wrists slightly bent, forming a circle as if hugging a tree or a large ball. Due to the almost neutral posture of the elbows and wrists, the stretch shortened state of the muscles in the arms is less pronounced. The anterior part of the deltoid is a shoulder flexor and is involved in bringing the arms up in front. The antagonist or muscle experience a reciprocal pull is the posterior part of the deltoid. A slight bend in the elbow or elbow flexion involves shortening of the biceps and stretching of the triceps. This shorten and stretch continues into the forearm with the anterior muscles involved in wrist and finger flexion being shortened as the fingers are slightly bent and the extensors in the posterior forearm being stretched. In some cases, cupping the hand is emphasized, and this would involve activation or shortening of the deep muscles in the anterior forearm or the inside of the forearm that act on the palmar aponeurosis. Although the muscles in the torso appear to have little involvement, when examining the parameters, we see that the torso muscles are very important to this posture. The parameter of pulling down the tailbone involves shortening the rectus abdominis which both pulls the rib cage down and pulls the pelvis up in front. Looking at the rear of the body, the erector spinae and other intrinsic muscles of the spine 
will have a lengthening pull from the downward position of the sacrum and upward position of the occipital bone of the skull. Another muscle to point out is the external oblique muscle. The external oblique interdigitates with the serratus anterior in its attachment to the ribs. The external oblique holds the ribs by counteropposing the contraction of the serratus anterior, allowing for its attachments to pull the scapula forward. In addition, its attachment into the rectus sheath creates additional upward tension on the pelvis. Further down, the muscles at the posterior of the body are also involved in the position of the pelvis. The hamstrings and glutes both attach to the rear of the pelvis and the sacrum and shorten to pull the tailbone down. The corresponding lengthening is in the iliopsoas, which is the iliacus and the psoas muscles, which attach on the anterior side of the pelvis down to the femur. The rectus femoris also acts reciprocally to the hamstrings. The rectus femoris is a hip flexor and knee extensor and contributes to anterior pelvic tilt. The quadratus lumborum or QL muscle may also experience a lengthening pull as the space between the posterior iliac or the back of the pelvis and the 12th rib will be increased. Although the position of the 12th rib may change during respiration due to activation of accessory respiratory muscles. Similar to the situation in the arms and upper limbs, the muscle tendon length and tension are not as pronounced in the lower legs. There's a slight knee bend. The calf muscles may experience a lengthening pull from the hamstrings above via fascial connections, the fascia lata and curl fascia, and maybe also due to the slight dorsiflex position of the foot. If we look at the angle between the shin and the foot, it is less than 90 degrees. This position is reciprocated by shortening of the anterior muscles of the lower limb, such as the anterior tibialis. Some may include gripping the ground with the feet as a parameter of this posture. This would include shortening activation of the deep muscles of the posterior lower leg and the foot itself and corresponding lengthening of the extensor foot muscles on the other side. Another aspect of this posture is how it affects respiration. As we see, the muscles in the front of the body are predominantly shortened and holding down the rib cage from the front. This encourages the practitioner to utilize the diaphragm to create thoracic space for the lungs to fill. In addition, the serratus posterior superior may be engaged to lift the posterior part of the rib cage during inhalation and then relax during exhalation to allow the serratus posterior inferior to pull it back down. Similarly, the posterior part of the intercostals may be engaged to help lift the ribs. This posture may be utilized to uniquely isolate and train the serratus posterior and posterior intercostal muscles as well as the diaphragm. The diaphragm itself is another contributor to the overall tensional network and possibly could be quite influential due to its many similar skeletal connections such as the cephoid process, costal cartilage, and lumbar spine, including fascial connections to the psoas and QL. The diaphragm's contraction may contribute additional tension in the muscles that share these skeletal and fascial connections. Now let's address two of the very important aponeurotic fascial sheaths, the rectus sheath and the thoracolumbar fascia. We see that both of these fascial sheaths will experience tension due to the activity or state of their muscular attachments. We've already guessed that the external oblique and rectus abdominis are active or shortened. But now note that the external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis all become part of the rectus sheath, particularly below the navel where the transversus abdominis moves from its deep position to join the anterior part of the rectus sheath. I would guess that activation in the external, external oblique may create subsequent activation in the transversus abdominis creating an inward pull of the navel. I notice this when pulling the tailbone down, I get an automatic inward pull of the navel, but this is just my experience. I'm not sure if others have it. The abdominal muscles form a connection to the thoracolumbar fascia. Thus activation of those muscles creates a pull on that aponeurotic fascial sheet as well. Combine this with the activation of the glutes 
and the pull from the stretch of the latch and the trapezius, and it's clear that there is a fair amount of tension pulling in many directions here as well. The myofascial meridians presented in Thomas Meyer's anatomy trains are a useful tool for visualizing and providing a map of the muscle and fascial interaction in the body. Here are the superficial back and front lines. In the back line, we see the path of the foot flexors, calves, hamstrings, and intrinsic spine muscles leading up to the skull. So as you may see from what we've described earlier, this posture creates a continuous stretch from tailbone to the skull along the muscles shown on the back line. Respectively, the muscles identified as being shortened are on the front line. The arm lines provide a similar example with the back line being stretched and the front line shortened. The spiral line shows the relationship we already discussed between the serratus anterior, external oblique, and rhomboids. The deep front line shows a relationship between the iliopsoas, QL, and the diaphragm. Looking at this rough markup of tension, what I find most interesting is how the tension seems to center about either moving towards or away from the area below the navel at the front of the body and at the lower back on the rear of the body. This has some overlap with the placement of Chinese martial arts conceptual Dantian and Ming Men points. The side view has a slight similarity to some Qi circulation diagrams I've seen in the past with a orbit going up the back and down the front. If I were to include the pelvic floor muscles, this would complete the bottom portion of the circle. Here's the references that I use for this analysis. I base the muscle state and activity on the function of muscle and the agonist and antagonist pairings found in these references. Information about fascia and its relationship to muscle is also found in these books. Check them out. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share it. For more content, check out my other posture and stance analysis videos. Subscribe and click the bell on YouTube so you're aware of my next uploads and follow me on Instagram.